Um, fantastic. So the talk we have today is going to be a bit longer than usual for our cafe size, but uh, I'm sure it will be completely worth the time. Uh, I'm very excited for it anyway. Um, so I'm very pleased to say we've got Sue Sayer talking today. She's probably the best expert I'll ever hear on talking on seals. Um, no pressure here, but uh, I'm very excited for this and she's going to tell us all about the Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust. Um, so Sue, do take it away if you want to give it a start. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much, David and Ben, for inviting me to do this talk. And thank you for turning up, which is really lovely. Very much appreciated. Uh, so I hope you can now see my screen. Maybe Yes, ben, that looks ben. good. Excellent. Okay. So I'm here tonight to talk about our iconic seals that we have in Cornwall. Um, they are a heritage species, having been seen on the Isles of Scilly since prehistory. Um, I'm from the Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about us. But in the last month, we have actually registered a second name for our charity. So we are now um, Seal Research Trust as well, because that's more inclusive and it better reflects the work that we've been doing nationally. So, uh, yeah, we, we work really hard to give seals a voice, basically. So my talk is about seals and people and our iconic seals, because most people think I do seals, but actually I do people because if I'm no good with people, I can't help seals. It's quite simple. This job is all about people and people politics. So um, my email address is there. If you're interested in sending us a seal sighting, even one seal in the sea from anywhere, you send it to sightings at cornwallsealgroup.co.uk. If you're interested in volunteering, and we have a lot of digital volunteers who stay at home and volunteer from there, processing work for us, then it's seals at cornwallsealgroup.co.uk. And if you really like getting out on the water and you fancy a day long boat survey, then it's Sarah at cornwallsealgroup.co.uk. And I always have to thank our funders. I'm a full time volunteer, as in fact, most of our volunteers are clearly. Uh, however, we do have some marine rangers who we have to fund, and, and I'm proud to say we've got public, private and voluntary organisations who fund us. Our guiding philosophy is that of sharing our seas, which is emblazoned across me tonight, um, and I learned fairly recently about the concept of an ecozoic. I read about it in a bird book by um, Douglas Adams. If you, uh, sorry, Adam Nicholson. If you've never heard of the Ecozoic, I suggest that you look it up because it really is a fantastic philosophy and we've taken it as our charities. Basically, it means that we're no, we should no longer see ourselves as a species that should be there to protect other species. But in an Ecozoic, we could actually understand that um, we rely on other species to exist ourselves. We are but one species among a planetary ecosystem and uh, we need to respect other species in order to survive ourselves. So I love the concept. Um, obviously, if you think it's interesting, do look it up. For us, every seal counts. Like every human being, you're all different people. You're not just human beings. These are not just grey seals. So on the left, we've got Fairy Girl. In the middle, we've got Shadow Puppet. And on the right, we've got Tulip. If I know the names of the seals, I've written them down the right hand side of the screen. The seal in the middle, Shadow Puppet, has the most beautiful belly pattern I've ever seen. But I want to tell you about Tulip, the seal on the right. So after a big storm event in the island of Skoma, where they do photo ID like we do here, uh, they'd never seen her before. But she suddenly appeared after a big storm event that had washed pretty much all the pups off the island of Skoma. She suddenly appeared and she'd obviously got milk. So she had lost her pup and she adopted another seal pup and bought it up. But Tulip is one of the regular seals that we see in Cornwall. So seals join up our network and uh, it's really fabulous to be able to share these amazing stories because by photo ID, we learn a lot more in depth about what seals are actually up to and what they're capable of, which is great. So the people stuff, um, Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust uh, in 2020 have set up and now have 20 community-based hubs around the Southwest Lots of volunteers. I'm not going to go through all of this. You can read faster than I can say it. Uh, but basically, we do about 12 surveys a day every single day of the year. And in 2020, we processed 140,000 photos. From those photos, we got 12,000 seal IDs. Um, seven seals that I first met in the year 2000 were still alive. And we collected some data about entanglement, disturbance, and also how rehabbed seals were doing. And why do we do all that? 
Well, we do that to make a difference and we do it to give seals a voice, as I mentioned earlier. So down the left were all the kind of statutory agency things that we did in order to represent seals. And down the right are some of the practical conservation things that we did in order to better protect seals on our patch. And in the middle were the three high profile TV programmes that we appeared on in 2020. Simon Reeve in Cornwall, uh, Gillian Burke was on Springwatch and Country File. And actually, we've just been on Country File again. So um, if you're interested, it was the last episode. And the, the Simon Reeve programme is on our YouTube channel if you're interested. So we have two species of seals in Cornwall, common seals and grey seals. And whilst we have a policy of not showing photos of seals looking at the camera online, because basically if a, if a seal is looking at the camera, it probably knows the camera's there and it's probably been disturbed already. Um, however, for the purposes of ID, I have made an exception here. So common seals have very spotty patterns or ringed patterns, whereas grey seals have blotchy patterns. And if you look at the heads closely, you'll see that the grey seal has a much stronger, longer nose profile that's flat, whereas the common seal, or they're also called harbour seals, whereas the common seal has a forehead and is much more snub nosed. So for me, common seals look more like cats and grey seals look more like Labradors, but um, that's just a kind of anecdotal description of their differences. If you look at the books, they talk about nostrils being V-shaped or parallel, but frankly, you're too close if you can work out the shape of their nostrils, and um, juvenile grey seal nostrils are very V-shaped as well, so it's not perfect science either. Okay, so um, common seal. This is a common seal we have in Cornwall. He's called Ellis. We originally called him Elisa because we thought he was a girl and then he turned out to be a boy. Um, and this is him on a mooring buoy in the Fowl. And we create calendars for the seals we identify. This is years across the top and months down the side and the numbers are the number of identifications per month. And the colour is the site. So you can see that he's been seen at three sites originally in Lou, and in the summer he likes visiting the fowl where he jumps on this mooring buoy. And common seals, if you see a seal on a buoy, it's going to be a common seal, I reckon, although they're proving me wrong all the time. Basically, what they do is they launch themselves out of the water and splat on top of the buoy. And then they go, whoa, like this, as they try and balance on top of the buoy. And then if they don't fall off, then they just stay there and go to sleep. But and I think common seals are only the, the only species agile enough to do that. But, you know, I'm sure there'll be a grey seal that proves me wrong somewhere. OK, this is Lucille. Lucille is a grey seal. And this is a photograph of her in North Devon, as you sorry, South Devon, as you can see, not looking at the camera. Of course, she's called Lucille because she spends most of her time in Lou, as you can see from her calendar. She's a clockwork seal, so you can expect to see her in Lou between April and September, after which she leaves to go and have her pup. But this photo was taken in South Devon. Well, you think that's not too far away from Lou, I suppose it's not really surprising. However, she has also been photographed in two different years up in North Cornwall. And that's quite a long journey all the way from South Devon up to North Cornwall. Grey seals live in the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm sure you're aware that this is a very wild place. Uh, if you didn't know, grey seals are our globally rare spe seal species. They're our equivalent of an African elephant. So if we want people to protect an African elephant on their patch so we can go and see it on safari, we need to do the same for grey seals uh, on our patch. More people live in Cornwall than there are grey seals in the world. I always find that surprising. And even though we've got a third of the world's population of grey seals in the UK, down from 50% when I started this, there are still more red squirrels in the UK than there are grey seals. So this is not a massive world population. Now, at the end, uh, we are going to put a link to this playlist. I'm going to play you videos. I am aware that they will play time lapse for you, but I've put them on a playlist on YouTube. So if you want to revisit them and you want to watch them without any jerkiness, then you can. And you can also read the captions and comments. Because we rely on grant funding as well, we would hugely appreciate you spending two to four minutes doing a survey monkey about what you thought about the talk as well. OK, first video, then this is a massive sea. You'll see how big it is when you see the seal swimming in it. There are waves coming in from the right and the top. And this is the habitat that the seals live in. 
it's the wild Atlantic Ocean. I'm just going to play that once more time so you can see how big these waves are. What always staggers me is that these seals have no control whatsoever over this environment. If they don't like their environment, they have one option, and that is to move. This environment is getting less predictable, um, and I'm going to tell you more about that. And there are two drivers for seals, food and genes. So I'm going to take you through those two. So I said the only option a seal has to move if it doesn't like its environment. Um, this is where seals in the southwest of England, well, actually from Cornwall, have actually visited. From our photo ID work, we know that seals from Cornwall have visited the Isle of Man, Northwest Wales, Southwest Wales, Eastern Ireland, Southeast Ireland, Wales, France, Belgium and Holland, Devon and Dorset. Um, and seals haven't read the books. So the books say that common seals travel less distance than grey seals. Well, Mickey and Victor are common seals. They obviously haven't read that book. So seals are quite like seabirds in that they have, they need marine habitat, obviously, but they also need land habitat, which seabirds obviously do to nest. But seals use the land to rest, digest, to socialise, work out their pecking order that they'll need later on in the year, and to pup, also to replenish their emergency oxygen supplies. So this is a seal coming out of the water and it's an adult male. I know it's a jerky video, but he's just crawled up quite a steep shelf that I think most people might think is surprising. Using powerful shoulders and elbows, he's using a lot of energy to get out of the water. This is an adult female seal who is looking for her pup. She is coming over the intertidal zone on a boulder beach to feed her pup. But look at the terrain that she has to cross in order to be able to do this. She's going to climb over these boulders. Who knew that seals could do this? However, the take home message for this for you is that coming out on the land uses an awful lot of energy and can be pretty risky. So she's just about to drop down the other side. And as she drops off the boulders on the other side, it's very easy to misjudge the distance and smash your chin potentially breaking a bone on the boulder. What you don't want to be doing over habitat like this is rushing. And then seals, obviously, when the tide comes in, need to leave the land and go in the sea. This video will speed up in a minute because it takes ages to play. This is a seal called Three Scars. And what he's doing is easing himself back into the water and acclimatizing gently and slowly. So like us, they've got sensitive bits they don't have blubber around their heads and their flippers and their bottom. So they feel the cold. And when the cold water hits them, they go just like we would. So ideally, they will let themselves into the sea slowly. They have counter current heat exchange systems in their flippers that enables them to take cold blood back to their core, cooling them down. And what they'd like to do is acclimatize rather than rush into the sea where they would get cold shock. Right, watch the nose and whiskers on this video. This is the seal bottling in the water at the surface and sleeping, having a yawn, but check out the nostrils and then see how mobile those whiskers are. Incredibly mobile. Every whisker has 1,500 nerve endings and your entire palm of your hand has 2,500. That makes their muzzles more sensitive than our palms of our hands. And that's how they explore the world. They also have a closed nostril when it's relaxed, but they have to use their muscles to open their nostrils to breathe at the surface. And the other amazing thing is that they have an autonomic reflex. That means that they take a few breaths at the surface and then they automatically sink below the surface. And when carbon dioxide levels build up in their blood, they have a rear flipper reflex that brings them back to the surface to take a few breaths. Gosh, nature's amazing, isn't it? The design is incredible. OK, on to food. I'm going to show you two world first videos. This is underwater, taken by a diver friend of ours, Dave McBride in the Isles of Scilly. This is several pregnant females feeding. And you can probably see whilst her eyes are open, she is actually sensing using her whiskers as well. And she's going to catch a small herring in a minute by the tail. And then she's going to suck it into her mouth. There's going to be a slow-mo in a minute, so you can watch it a little bit better. 
But basically, we knew that common seals had a snatch and suck method. No movement here, look, but just sucking, no grabbing, sucking. We knew that common seals did that, but we didn't know that grey seals did it. And this is the first video I've ever seen of that process taking place. So for me, it was a world first. This too. So there are, uh, it was sent in by Matt Hawkes, also from the Ars of Silly, who's a member of the public, and he thought it was amazing. And what I think we're seeing here is a seal in the middle zigzagging up a gully. And if you watch this on YouTube, you'll see a flash down in the bottom left hand corner of sand eels. And what that seal is doing is zigzagging and herding the fish up the gully so that when it gets to the end of the gully, it can do a massive you know, feeding frenzy with all these fabulous sand eels. But the key message here that I want you to take away is that seals catch a lot of food underwater that we don't see. In fact, more tons of sand eels and dragonets, which are both tiny fish, are eaten than any other single species. So we only ever get to see the big stuff because if they catch a big fish, they have to bring it to the surface to eat it where we can see it. But most of their food is small stuff, sand eels, small herrings or dragonets for sure. OK, on to genes. So I think you know where this is going. Uh, OK, this is an adult female seal. She's called Crosscomb. She's beautiful. I've known her since 2003. Uh, females are light and spotty and every single female can have a pup after the age of six every single year. There's no menopause, so they can actually pup till they drop. Bless them. However, common sense tells you that they won't be fit and fat enough to have to sustain a pregnancy every year. So they probably do have break years, but it is physically possible for them to pop every year. Males, in contrast, this adult male seal is plain and dark, no light belly like the female. But most males in the seal world are non-breeding. Gosh, we could learn an awful lot from seals. Uh, this is a non-breeding male and all he does is rest, sleep and feed, rest, sleep and feed. Oh, sorry, move, sleep and feed, move, sleep and feed. That's all he does in his entire life. And most males are non-breeding. However, the, some of them are beach masters, dominant males who get to mate with the females. And believe it or not, the seal in the middle is a beach master called Feathers. But you can see he is nowhere near the biggest seal on the beach. The one on the right is much bigger. So we have come to the conclusion that beach masters must be excellent leaders with an X factor. As yet undetermined. But let's face it, they must be pretty adaptable to whatever circumstances thrown at them. They have to be patient because all they're going to get is grief from the females saying, get lost, I'm not ready, get lost, I'm not ready, get lost. That's all they get from their females. So they have to be patient and they have to be empathetic and respectful of their females. They can try and force themselves on a female, but if she is not interested and does not like the male, she'll tell him to get lost and she'll win because SEAL society is female dominated. So only if he has treated her with respect will she allow him to mate with her. So here are two males competing, okay? There is a wannabe beach master called Peapod at the bottom and an experienced beach master at the top called DP2. And the wannabe beach master is in the leadership position up the beach. The control position is up the beach. But I think you can just see that the power position has just shifted. Just gonna play it back again, actually. So basically, wannabe beach master is in the power position and DP2 is in a weak position, but he's a clever boy and he knows there's a big wave coming. So he's taking what's getting at him at the minute. He's taking it until the next big wave hits. And then he's going to use that wave to reach the power position on the beach and take control of the situation. And now Peapod's in trouble. He's got a back and face, back and face, back and face. He cannot afford to turn tail and run off and the reason he can't afford to turn tail and run off is because DP2 will rip the webbing on his rear flippers and then he won't be able to swim and plead. So it's absolutely crucial, a kind of power play like that when you're watching it on the beach. I just want to draw attention to the fact that this beach master is called DP2 because I'm going to tell you a bit more about him in a minute. OK, so genes mating. So this is an adult male beach master called Tamfire doing the business basically, and his female is called kelp. And I saw them mating on the beach and I thought, well, that's 
private situation. They were surrounded by the seals, but I felt I was a bit of an intruder watching. So I watched them a little bit. And then I went up the coast to do a survey on the next beach. And when I came back, they were doing this about an hour later. So this is mating for the second time. And nobody knew until last year and some of the work that we did on the lizard that male seals will mate with the same female more than once. On this case, on the same day, but on the lizard, they did it on different days. But as you can see from this video, it's a fairly relaxed affair. So there's a bit of, you know, aggression and strength has to be involved to get in position in the first place. I think the biology bit is over quite quickly. And then they spend 20 minutes or so locked together, literally locked together. And the biology reason for that is obviously it allows the sperm to get where it needs to go to fertilize the egg without any other seals coming and messing about um, in the process. However, science didn't know and probably still doesn't know because we haven't done a paper on it yet, that seals will mate more than once um, in a day or on different days. And why do they compete for females? Well, to do this. This is a female called, um, oh, I can't see a name, don't remember a name either, uh, whitefish coming up the beach. And she's just about to sneeze because she is using smell, turning her head to the right in front and to the left, smelling for the scent of her pup because the pup has moved since she left it. The tide's gone out and it's come back in again and her pup has moved. So she's moving up the beach. She's sneezing to clear her nostrils so she can better scent. And she's having a good look to see if she can see it as well. She's now got the strongest scent from this direction. And now she's heading straight for her pup, who's suddenly aware of her mum's presence. Fantastic. But the sense of smell is much like that of a dog's um, and really important to a seal. OK, so this is a different mum called uh, Ringpool, I think she's called, and she is now feeding her pup. Beautiful thing to observe. Did you know that seal pups only get fed for three weeks? They start as a 10 kilo thin chip and in three weeks they actually go to a 40 kilo fat barrel. And only if they're 40 kilos will they stand any chance of surviving their first winter because their mothers feed them brilliantly on a really high, high percentage fat milk. However, the mums don't teach them what to feed and how to catch it. So sorry, what to eat and how to catch it. So they have a really challenging time and they have to live off those fat reserves. OK, this is I put in recently because this is new news hot off the press. This is DP2, who I told you about was in that mating video. Uh, sorry, the, the scrap video between the two beach masters. This is his calendar. I've known him since 2000. He is actually the oldest ID seal I ever, I've ever known. He's actually at least 28 years old and possibly more like 35 years old. Um, but we've seen him at five or six, dif five different sites. This yellow one is his pupping site, and he was there between 2011 and 2015. However, he disappeared in 2016, and I feared the worst, having been such a regular visitor. And I saw him once before he suddenly turned up at Lizard South on the other coast. So I'm on the north coast, and he turned up on the south coast. We saw him quite a few times in 2018, just once in 2019, and then 2020, I thought, ah, oh, yeah, he's dead. I mean, I was out surfing because I can walk to my site. But yeah, we think he's probably dead now. No, he's just turned up back at his pupping site or his breeding site in 2021. And this is the photo of him looking around for a girl. However, this is his chosen girl, Ghost. She's a very special seal. She's a world record record breaking seal for having the most number of pups consecutively. I suspect other females have probably had more pups, but we, nobody's ever recorded it. So it's great to get this information. She's, she pupped on one beach and thereafter she pupped on exactly the same beach in all these years, bar 2018, which was a complicated year. If you want to find out about that, I can tell you it was linked to storm events in 2017. Ask me if you're interested. I don't want to take too long explaining that. Uh, and then she's had her pup at the same site until 2020. And then in 2021, blow me down with a feather, she had a pup on the south coast on the lizard. Along with, this is her with her pup, newborn pup, she's still got blood on her stomach. Uh, this is her. And blow me down, she was with this seal. Well, this seal is my legendary rescue, who I rescued as a white coat back in 20. 
let's see, 2009. I rescued her in 2009 and now she's having her own pups, which is really lovely. But these two are having a bit of a Barney look. Ghost is protecting her pup. The reason of telling you this story is between 2011 and 2015, I know for sure that these two, the male and the female, mated as partners. And we saw something new about Beachmasters. It's not just about keeping a territory so you can mate with females. It's about sometimes having a chosen female that you particularly like. So he was no longer strong enough to keep a site for three months as a Beachmaster. But he would come in just before Ghost, he would protect Ghost and then he would mate with Ghost and she would only mate with him during that time. She wouldn't let other seals try and mate with her. So these were chosen partners for those five years. But of course, the sad thing is he's turned up in 2021, hoping that he might happen upon Ghost. And where's she? On the wrong bloody coast, down on the south coast, having a pup, bless her. So who knew that there were such sad love stories with seals, hey? Right, this is Ghost again, um, with her pup and a second pup, who is, both of these pups are at serious risk of being washed out by those massive waves. So can you see Ghost? She's looking between the two, she's checking they're okay, but this is her pup that she has to prioritise. And the survey volunteer, Simon Bone, who took this video, said that she saved that other pup's life because it got up around the back of the back of the boulder that you can see in the frame wasn't dragged into the sea and if it had been dragged into the sea it would have been doomed because its mother wouldn't have been able to find it wouldn't have been able to feed and it would have died so I'm just going to play that video again because I'd like you to be able to see the nuances she's moving with her pup chaperoning her pup the big wave hits but she'd obviously seen this other pup so she checks her pups okay and then scares the other one into moving up the other side of the beach who knew that seals could be that kind of empathetic or that caring of another seal's pup? And then as soon as that second big wave has hit, what she does is she puts her arm around her own pup and she escorts it carefully up that side of the beach. Gosh, I think seals are amazing. And then I put this in because it's a gratuitous video of the fattest seal pup I have ever seen. It is as fat as its mother, who is obviously quite young, but as an inexperienced mum, gosh, she's done a great job. So this pup will now be three weeks old. It has lost its long white coat. And in that three weeks, it's gone from 10 to probably 50 kilos. To be fair, it's stupidly fat. However, the Atlantic Ocean is all change, as I'm sure you are aware. Whether you believe in climate change being a natural or anthropogenic phenomenon, climate change is affecting seals. I'm going to talk about ext extreme weather events, but storms are probably the biggest impact on seal pups. For example, Storm Brian washed 75% of pups off the island of Scoman and 50 off the Isle of Man in a single night. If you were on the Isles of Scilly as a seal pup, I suspect 100% of pups got washed off the Isles of Scilly because it's very low lying. So I think that's a really major impact on seals. And then there's all the human stuff. Tourism, recreation for disturbance, harbours are very dangerous places and people love to feed seals. It's very bad for them. We need to practice tough love and never feed them because it leads to things like this. Seals getting hooked in a harbour. Uh, household outflows, I'm going to talk a little bit about those and marine debris, but this is a bicourt seal. So this is an example of um, fisheries accidental bycatch of seals. And if you believe the data from DEFRA, 310 seals were bicourt in 2015 alone around Devon and Cornwall. This is a really big issue. It exceeds the population levels, according to the Sea Mammal Research Unit. And they don't understand. To be honest, it's only because they don't know how many seals there are in Cornwall, but hey ho. And then this is a bad place for a seal pup to be brought up. Look, you only need a six inch nail in that bit of wood to know it would be a bad place. And then there's all the single use plastic. OK, so some phenology shifts that we have recorded. The peak haul out season back in 2013-14 was April, but in 2020 it was December. And we've had a steady shift earlier for peak haul out seasons. Popping season is also moving earlier. So popping season used to be October followed by November. 
Now it is September followed by August. And you know what happens in August and September in Cornwall, we get a lot of visitors. So we are now looking at a lot of interactions between people and seal pups to the detriment of seal pups, which is why we try to raise awareness about our watching seals well messaging. We need to stay 100 metres from these animals at least, unless you're on a cliff top, in which case they can't see you. OK, we've also seen haul out extensions being used in the summer when they never used to be that we during lockdown, we we discovered a haul out that had moved completely to a different place. So when we give seal space, they take it. The problem is when we don't most of the time give seal space and we need to learn to do that. And then along the south coast, we've seen quite a lot of recolonizations of sites possibly as a result of the Southwest Water Clean Sweep program, which means the water is much cleaner. And also environment and agency work on the farms, meaning that the runoff is less toxic. OK, so this is a key pupping site. There are two pupping caves down in the corner here. And I'm trying to show you with my mouse. And this was end of September. So mid September, it was the start of a pupping season. This is what it looked like a week later. So I'm just going to play that backwards and forwards. Those two pupping caves are now completely blocked. And one of my favourite seals, Boomers, I last saw her outside that cave just before that rock fall. I haven't seen her since. So we know that mums and pups would have been trapped in that cave. Extreme weather events are leading to more extreme cliff collapses, which is having more of an impact on seals, perhaps even more than sea level rise, because sea level rise is happening at a slightly slower rate. That means they can adapt potentially to it. Um, for a malted seal pup, it has to teach itself to feed and how to catch it. It's a very steep learning curve. And how do they learn? Well, they are very curious creatures, which makes them very engaging with us. And they learn through play. Show and tell with other seals, trial and error. Oh, that didn't taste very good. And elimination. Yeah, this isn't a very good food source, for example. Curiosity can get them into all sorts of trouble. They'll come into harbours where uh, historically fishers chucked discards and they will have fed off them. And now if a seal is in a harbour like this one, Radley, they tend to get fed a lot. So we really do need to practice tough love, follow the signs and don't feed them. But I'm just going to play that video again to show you why harbours are dangerous places. So Radley spends the summer in Newquay Harbour and as she swims away, you'll see a dark triangle of dots. And we're pretty sure that dark triangle of dots was a close encounter with a propeller. But either way, she regularly gets hooked, as so does her compatriot Trunk, who spends a lot of time in, in Newquay Harbour as well. So she was exploring the GoPro with her whiskers, but um, basically harbours are dangerous places for seals. The most dangerous thing in a harbour is actually diesel. If, you in, if a seal inhales diesel, it will lead to slow organ failure. And then there's more obvious stuff. So this is a seal called Lucky Star coming up the beach looking tangled in lost fishing gear. We would like to have rescued him that day, but it took four months before British Divers Marine Life Rescue and us were actually able to cut the net off his neck. And the reason we weren't able to rescue him on this day was because, look, he's just spotted people on the clifftop and he's turning around and legging it back into the sea. He's not sure. And because of disturbance, we weren't able to rescue him for four months. Uh, this is why seals get entangled. So this is a seal who has just found a load of trawl net in the sea and is playing with it and thinking this is great fun until his flipper claw gets caught because the seal's panic response is to spin. And when you spin with a sheet of net, you end up cocooning yourself. Now, fortunately, Mike Stevens, who took this video, watched the seal unspin itself. But if you've ever tried to untangle a bit of rope, Spinning yourself out of a bit of net is a very risky business and the chances are you're not going to succeed. If you have a dog and, and your dog likes frisbees, please use solid frisbees because ringed frisbees, when they get lost on beaches, pose a threat to all sorts of marine life. We've had our first two frisbee seals in 2021, so we're hoping to do a campaign about that. And then disturbance. Well, disturbance is the great news story. Bad because it's not good for seals. They have raised heart rates, raised breathing rates, stress hormone responses, and they'll leg it into the sea getting cold shock. They'll race over rocks, as I'll show you in a minute. So this seal, Radley, is sticking her tongue out at these two kayakers who are too close. 
But the good news is we can all do something about this today by pointing the finger at ourselves and saying, if we see a seal, are we more than 100 metres away? And if we are, we're doing the right thing and being responsible. We need to not point fingers at everyone else. We just need to point the finger at ourselves. The problem with disturbances the summer in the summer is that pregnant females like Radley, who are in their final trimester of pregnancy, will lose precious energy. And when I was filming with Ellie just recently for Country File, she came out with a sentence that I've asked if I can quote everywhere because it's brilliant. In the wild, every calorie counts and can make the difference between life and death. That is not something that sits well with us because we worry about eating too many calories all the time. I'm speaking for myself here. Uh, we, we have a plethora of calories in the human world. That's not true in the wild. And every calorie counts in the wild. So if this female, Radley, doesn't get fat enough in the summer because she's wasting energy through disturbance, she won't make her pup fat enough in the autumn and it will not make it through its first winter. But of course, that's an invisible delayed impact. So we ask people to not seek out encounters with seals, close encounters with seals. You can't get close up and personal with a seal without disturbing it, without having an energy impact on it. So these people really were not doing what we would want them to do. The male is about, he's protecting a pregnant female and he's about to leg it into the sea. She will follow and of course, bouncing on your pup across rocks is never a good idea and can lead to all sorts of complications. We need to give seals space. Seals have chosen this place. They don't rock up everywhere. They have chosen places. And what we as humans really need to do is give them those spaces and play elsewhere. So what is the response to a disturbance event? Well, the worst level response is a tombstone like this. Now, frankly, this is the sort of rock I might tombstone off. OK, it's not that dangerous. I might be OK if there's no rocks under the surface. However, this is an altogether different ball game. This is a juvenile seal with no particular blubber layers around its middle and it's scared stiff. As it bounces off the rocks, it's very easy for it to break a rib or even worse, smash its bottom jaw. Then it's had a life threatening injury that it won't survive. But of course, again, invisible impact. Well, you can see the impact of the tombstone, but you can't see the internal injuries. And then the impact is delayed because the seal will probably die a few months later. The other response is to stampede. And this is a seal stampede over a boulder beach taken in, in West Cornwall by me. You can see this seal already has blood on its side. Here's the frisbee seal. And there's an entangled seal here. Must be incredibly painful racing over rocks when you've got an open wound above your neck that's constantly moving. And of course, the seals can injure themselves when they do 100 metres over boulders like this. So I know what to look for with my massive zoom lens from a clifftop. I have a bridge camera that's a 2000 to 3000 millimetre lens zoom. It's huge. So from the clifftop, I can see these blood trails that seals lose after a leave after a stampede. There are three different blood trails in this photo as the seals all congregated through that gap. However, on that particular day, there were 17 different blood trails, which means that 17 seals injured themselves in that stampede. So the bad news, disturbance is always a waste of energy, it often results in injury and it can sometimes be fatal. In the wild, every calorie counts and can make the difference between life and death. But the good news is we've got some great research evidence on this. So in 2019, we did some human and, and human activity and seal surveys. We looked at what seals were doing and what people were doing and the interactions between them. This is what two hours at a sensitive seal site looks like in the summer. 30 different activities around this sensitive seal site, which means they're very busy places. So if you're interested, David can share a link to these two reports the Cornwall based report on the left and a national report that we wrote on the right, summarising our results. But I'm going to tell you what they were. At best, seals were disturbed once every 27 minutes in Mounts Bay and at worst, every 14 minutes in St Ives Bay. This is a chronic issue of repeated disturbance. It's not a one off event that is going to have a chronic impact on energy and potentially life threatening consequences. 
But the really useful bit of the findings was that at every site, the cause of disturbance was different. So in Newquay, it was mostly air-based stuff because of the airport. So you just need to get the flight paths changed for that one. In Mounts Bay, it was non-motorised boats and tripper boats equally. St Ives 1, it was mostly ribs and tripper boats. And St Ives 2, it was mostly tripper boats. So we have chosen to work at this site where just targeting that one audience, we could make a hell of a difference to seals. So in 2021, we got some money out of DEFRA through the Green Recovery Challenge Fund to repeat those surveys at those sites, which we have just completed and the report will be out before Christmas. Headlines from Mounts Bay suggest that disturbance is almost twice as bad in 2021 as it was in 2019, which is very scary. But let's see what the full report says. So what we did in 2021 is we said, can we set up a St Ives Bay stakeholder group to work on the issue and ask a few fundamental questions? Do we love St Ives Bay? Is it special? Do we care about the seals there? If we do, what can we do to help seals in St Ives Bay? And what guidelines and things could we put in place that we are prepared to sign up and follow? And I'm delighted to say it will form a talk next year if you need me back, but it will be all the ideas that this stakeholder group have come up with, which is things like guidelines about how to operate around the boat, a seal of approval scheme, watercraft stickers, that go on higher, higher things, talking about how to enjoy wildlife if you've hired a vessel and you weren't expecting to see any, all sorts of things. So uh, the stakeholder group is great. It's a community generated management plan by local people. And I think that's the thing that's going to make a difference as opposed to a national imposed from the top scheme. I chair the SEAL Alliance um, Disturbance Working Group, which learns through a partnership from other SEAL related organisations. And we have a website if you're interested. And what the SEAL Alliance has done is engage the politicians. So we had a meeting with George Eustace, the Environment Secretary. It's a bit of a cheat because obviously you'll know he's a local MP, but also Rebecca Powell, who is his parliamentary undersecretary. And we've had three things that we've asked of them. We want disturbance for seals to be made illegal like it is with whales and dolphins. We want the wildlife legislative green paper review that's coming out before December to include seals. And we want Natural England, who've already started to be fair, to be supported to review the triple SI review process because we have three triple SIs in Cornwall where it is a criminal offence to disturb a seal punishable with an unlimited fine. We need that nationally just to protect these sensitive seal sites. So we've had a parliamentary petition this year, an early day motion, a 10 minute rule bill will be out next year. And we're about to send an open letter to government with those requests. We've also produced a national leaflet. I've sent 54,000 of these out around the UK. This is the outside of a leaflet. This is the inside of a leaflet, really nice and user friendly, simple language and basic messages. But this also forms a sign. And I've sent out 99 signs to the north of John O'Groats and south of Land's End. It's even been translated into French. So uh, if you know if you know anyone who's who's keen to distribute leaflets and stuff, do get in touch. This is in North Tyneside with the seals behind it. This is in the Gower in southwest Wales. And this is a local water sports shop who have taken a load of leaflets that they're going to use to prep people before they hire vehicles. So the other thing we've done is set a photo policy for seals online. I mentioned before about not using photos of seals looking at the camera. A seal looking at the camera could be aware of the camera and has already potentially been disturbed. If a seal's looking at you, it's probably been disturbed. So we've started to use slightly less good quality, admittedly, photos of seals doing natural relaxed behaviour, which frankly are much more interesting anyway, and usually a lot more dramatic. Always take seal photos from a distance. You can't take a decent selfie of a seal for sure. And we ask people if they're posting photos online of seals that they have seen to only include small numbers of seals. If you include a massive haul out, somebody always says, where is it? And somebody else always answers it. And what we're doing is driving up football and creating a bigger issue. 
We also ask that people use the generic, a generic name for the site, like St Ives Bay, as opposed to a specific site name. If somebody's interested, they'll ask you and you can private message them and tell them. But to avoid sharing to a, you know, a not really interested audience um, and increasing footfall, because the site that I survey at can't cope with more visitors physically can't cope with more visitors, let alone the seals coping in terms of disturbance. But we do still have a lot of resources with seals looking straight out of the leaflet. So we're going to wait until those have run out before we uh, change. So we can't throw them away. That would be immoral. So this is a great photo of a seal. It's good quality. It's not close up. It's taken with a big zoom. The seal's not aware of the camera and it's even got its second eyelid across. That's how relaxed it is. So to sum up then, seal society is very complicated thanks to the ecozoic. <laughs> no such thing as an average seal. Who knew seals in Cornwall were so well traveled? Obviously they need joined up protected habitat for different seasons. We think every seal has a different combination of pupping, molting and summer foraging site and that they visit year on year. And whether we like it or not, we're already impacting their health, welfare and mortality. And I'd just like to thank all our amazing volunteers. They're all, incredible citizen scientists we're always looking for new ones we do have some online volunteer training but they work from wales all the way through to hampshire to send us records why are they great well because their eyes and ears for changings and issues on their patch they'll do surveys they will process photos at home on the computer make and confirm ids digitize data so put it into excel so it can go into our access database we have People in Sweden and uh, people in Scotland and people in Alderney who have analysed data for us as volunteers and written reports for us, they will fundraise for us to help us fund rangers to look after our volunteers and they'll be ambassadors and champions for SEALs on their patch. Please do follow us on social media. If you'd like to find out more, we've got a YouTube channel. There are 18 short talks, not long talks, but short ones on there that you might be interested in. The Simon Reeve programme is on there. And uh, there's two videos, one of a seal mum being disturbed away from a pup. So it's a pup Mr. Feed, 1% of its nutrition gone. That only has to happen a few times and that pup's doomed. And uh, a mum feeding a pup, which is a really nice one. We've just had our second, my first... I'm a first author on two papers now. This is my second one. It's literally just been published um, about post-release monitoring of rehabilitated grey seals um, over a long time in a big area. So we're really pleased about that. <clears throat> Apologies for the American spelling, but it's an American journal. And um, plug. Um, uh, we have an online shop. We use our online shop, our wild seal and supporter adoption scheme, and our fundraising and donations to fund our rangers. That's our plan going forward. So if you do need any Christmas presents, there's some great ones on our online shop. And um, please do think about doing that survey monkey for us, please. I really do need the feedback. And I'm sure we'll put the link in the chat shortly. Thanks very much for listening. Um, and I'm done. Thank you so much, Sue, that was great. Uh, I've put the links that you mentioned into the chat already. Um, Fabulous, thank you. Great, yeah, I see you've got a little applause emoji as well already in the, uh, one of the boxes. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed your talk, um, really fascinating. Um, you covered so much as well, that was great. Um, if anybody has any questions, please do put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and come straight on. Yeah. In the meantime, while everyone is digesting and um, thinking about what to ask, um, I'd like to use my privilege to use uh, to ask one of the first questions. You're very welcome. So um, the all these things that you mentioned and kind of hinted at with the beach masters and the non-breeding males and things like that point to really yeah. interesting social dynamics and seals, uh, yes. which I had no idea about, which just sound fascinating. And even things like that, the mums don't actually teach the pups how to catch uh, food. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, these social dynamics. Are there any sort of roles that these non-breeding males play in seal society? Oh, gosh, David, that's a very astute question. I've never been asked that before, and it's a bloody great question. Uh, the reason it's a great question uh, is because um, I think, and science doesn't say this, so it's not, it's just theory. I think that non-breeding males teach juveniles how to be a seal. So all these seals have got to learn to feed. I mean, I, I, I was sent some video off Paul Kerno by a member of the public, and it just looked like an adult male teaching juveniles how to fish. 
Uh, and I, I'm sure, why would they not have a role? You know, it makes no biological sense for them to not have a role. And you do see large numbers of males hauled out with large numbers of juveniles, particularly during the molting season. So it makes perfect sense to me. I think those non-breeding males have a big and important role to play. Uh, it seems like the most logical explanation if they kind of plug that gap with where the moms yeah. don't actually teach the pups. Yeah, and you Maybe mentioned, some... sorry, sorry keep going. Um, you mentioned about mums. Um, I, I alluded to the fact that um, obviously when mums mate, they're going to potentially have their eggs fertilised, but I'm not sure if you're aware they do delayed implantation. So uh, the egg gets fertilised, but the mum has lost a third of her body weight feeding her pup. She can't sustain a pregnancy. So that egg doesn't implant. And only if she gets fat and fit over the next three months with the egg implant and start to grow into a fetus. Um, and it, there is another name for it. Um, and I just think it's utterly amazing. Other species do it, so badgers do it, but it enables mums to have pups on 12 month cycles, which makes them predictable for volunteers like us if we've been watching them long enough. Great. Maybe that's a topic for your next paper then as well with the uh, <laughs> what the non-breeding males do as well. Yes, maybe. Do you know what? We have about 50 papers in us. But um, as you, I'm sure, will appreciate, getting papers published is a rather painful process. Yes. <laughs> uh, you're obviously based at the University of Exeter, and it is the University of Exeter who support us through that process. So I don't know if you saw, but Dr. Matthew Witt and Dr. Lucy Hawkes were the two supervisors on that paper. And we would not be able to do what we've done in terms of publishing without the support of the University of Exeter, particularly through Brendan Godley. He's been amazing. I did spot that on the papers. That was actually one of the things I was going to ask if you do publish your research, but you've addressed that already in the talk. So <laughs> thank you for that already. Uh, we've had one question just come through from Robin um, asking about uh, how you recognize the pups. So can you recognize pups once they're grown up so that you can then actually trace lineages and families through the years? So Robin, thank you very much for your applause. I saw that earlier too. Um, it's very challenging. So obviously we do our photo ID based on their unique fur patterns. We look for pictures in their patterns and then our brain is very good as a computer for remembering those patterns. Um, however, they go from a long white coat to a patterned coat at varying speeds. So I, the fastest malted pup I've ever seen was at 15 days, fully malted. Uh, uh, however, some at three weeks will still have a white coat. It seems to depend on the amount of time that they spend in the water. So there is a continuum between pups that never go in the water and never use any energy, so get really fat, and other pups who prefer it in the water do use energy, don't get as fat, but build up swimming and diving skills that makes them good at feeding. So bearing in mind that we have to catch them as they lose that long white coat to get their adult pattern that they keep for life, it can be a challenge and we haven't done it with many seals to be fair. Um, I don't know why we found it such a challenge, but maybe seals that, are, oh no, I, I don't know. I'm not even gonna go there. I don't know why that is. But one that I can tell you about, Rocket, um, I saw him born on the beach in 2007 and we thought he would never make it because his mum was bleeding from the right eye and really struggling to find him, uh, to, to, sorry, to get him to take his first feed. And I remember standing on the cliff top with two friends saying, oh, this is really worrying. He's never going to make it. And Terry, who was massively experienced, said to me, they've been living for millennia. Stop it. They'll be fine. You just need to not worry about them. And I thought, well, I can't watch over high tide. This is going to be hideous because she, mum was getting really stressed. She kept trying to put her teeth in the right place in front of the pup's nose. She even crawled over the top of him at one point and crushed him because she was so stressed trying to feed him. Of course, Rocket is still about today. Uh, he grew ridiculously quickly. He obviously got the hang of it overnight, how to feed. Uh, uh, but he's done some weird stuff. So I'd always thought that pups, female pups, will come back to their natal site to breed. Therefore, to keep the gene pool big, the males born on the same beach must beach master somewhere else. Otherwise, they're mating with their sisters and mothers. That's a bit weird. Um, however, Rocket came back trying to beach master on the beach he was born on. 
chucking his weight around, looking really stupid. Actually, he's been quite he's quite been quite incompetent at it, to be fair. But maybe he was just coming back to practice at a site where he felt comfortable and familiar. And maybe he, I mean, he, I haven't seen him mate with any females. I've just seen him throwing his weight around as a beach master. So maybe once he's built up his skills doing that, he'll go and try and mate somewhere else. But, you know, there's so much, Robin, that we just don't know. We have an awful lot to learn. Thanks for your great question, though. Thanks for a very um, clear and um, yeah, very clear answer. And I love how much you know about these seals and how much personality uh, you, you can see in each of them. Uh, slightly if related I, to what I'm honest, question. David, it took me about 10 years before I even began to be, be aware of behavior. That's how long it takes to kind of get familiar with a subject in the wild properly. Mm. It's, it's very hard to do. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, that's fine. I guess it's quite a takes a while to kind of re-gear your brain to seeing seals as individuals rather than a group of seals. Well, it's just um, seeing the nuances of this is what I'm used to seeing and this is something different. So what on earth is going on here and what what is what is that all about? It's that kind of thing, I guess. Yeah, I was just wondering who gets to name the seals. I noticed oh, wow. a lot of really cool names in the presentation. Well, I have silly names, really, but they're all named after their fur patterns to help our volunteers remember them. So obviously I've been doing photo ID since 2000. We've now delegated a shed load of catalogues to a shed load of volunteers who are all familiar with their site. And then we have a shared space on Facebook where we share seals to, to do matches between catalogues. But we name them after the patterns we see in the fur. So if we see a tree shape, tree is a tag word that goes into the name. And the first three or four or five tag words that we see become the seal's name which when they become a bit of a celebrity, um, we, we just give them one chosen name like ring pull or whitefish. Um, but they do have a pedigree name of ridiculously tag names. So mushroom, tornado, tree, uh, what other ones? Um, oh, I, I, why can't I suddenly? Frog, uh, kelp, anything like that. You know, you, if you see the picture in the pattern, we put the tag words into search with later. So if we see a seal and we see yeah. a tree pattern in it, if we don't recognize it, we think it's got a tree pattern. So we search for the word tree pattern and it brings up a short list of seals that someone has seen a tree pattern in, and then you have a better chance of identifying it. That's a really good system. <laughs> I thought they were just silly names from the presentation, but <laughs> well impressed. <laughs> Glad I followed up on that. Okay. Um, Got one more a bit. Um, actually, we'll jump over to Robin's other question, seeing as I just saw that pop up. Uh, I don't want to monopolize this. Um, asking about other species of seals beside common and grey. Um, are there more even outside of the UK? Oh, loads. There are 18 um, uh, fossil seal species globally. Fossil seal species are the ones without ears. Um, and then there's sea lions and um, sea lions and uh, fur seals who do have ears. And then there's the otorids, which are the walruses. So you probably heard about the walrus that we had in Cornwall. Um, OK, so that's the species out of habitat. And I fear he would have been the first of many species that we're going to have out of habitat. So we have had, interestingly, in two different years, but in both years, we had a harp and a hooded seal appear in Cornwall in both those years, which is what makes me think it's to do with currents. You know, if the currents are right and there are lost seals and they will then find their way to the UK and Cornwall's the first landing point. So uh, that's why they end up in Cornwall. So we have had hooded, harp, um, and then we had a ringed seal, which came from somewhere like Svalbard, turned up in Sutton Harbour in Plymouth. So I have a feeling that that was a stowaway seal but it could have swum here on its own, who knows? And then we had the walrus. So I contacted an expert uh, called Laurie Quakenbush. She does Alaskan walruses, uh, different, obviously different ocean, different, slightly different species, but apparently same sort of behavior. And uh, she told me that she thought our walrus in the Scillies and in the north coast of Cornwall had come from a Svalbard, north of Norway. Um, I don't know if you followed the story, but basically it appeared in Wales, then it went to Cornwall, uh, Wales, sorry, Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, France, Spain, Isles of Scilly, and uh, 
well, frankly, it was at great risk in the Isles of Scilly. I need to be careful what I say, but um, it was damaging property and that makes life very challenging. So we had to do emergency meetings and then British Divers Marine Life Rescue sent Lizzie Larbalestier over uh, as a monitor to help the local Isles of Scilly Wildlife Trust um, keep an eye on the walrus and to try and mitigate the damage that he was doing to property. So we started to, we built, well, Lizzie built him a pontoon, covered it in his scent that she picked up from boats and he found the pontoon very quickly and started hauling out on that instead. But we used a comment that Laurie had told us, which is um, walruses are oh, figmotactic. There's a brand new word for me, figmotactic. And it means they communicate through touch. If there are two walruses on a beach, they will lie next to each other touching. That's how much they need company. And of course, this walrus was on its own. So it needed physical contact around its body to rest. So she built him an armchair, which was a flat pontoon with three sides that he could touch. And he found it within about two hours of it having been built and smeared with his scent. And he used it instead of boats, so he stopped damaging property. Of course, when we had the heat wave in the summer, he got too hot, so she had to enlarge the pontoon for him. And she put signs about keeping distance because Laurie Quakenbush had told us that he would only leave if he'd rested up enough and had got enough energy to do a long journey. And sure enough, you know, few few weeks, three weeks of rest, I think it was maybe four in the Isles of Scilly, and he went on to Ireland. And the latest sighting of him, photo ID'd from Scars, was in Iceland. So he'd gone halfway back to where he was headed. So he'd done 4,000 kilometers before he got to us. So probably 5,000 kilometers to get up to um, Iceland. He's disappeared from Iceland. We really hope he'll be back in Svalbard, but we'll never know. He's not gonna be the, the last, is he? Global warming means there are gonna be more. There are, there's one, at least one in Germany at the moment. There are gonna be more subarctic species in our waters. Mm. Thank you. Really interesting um, perspective on this news story from a few months back that I just followed. I was like, oh, funny, there's a walrus here, but great to hear this side of things as well. Yeah, well, um, most people thought the story was really funny. And to be yeah. honest, for those of us who were looking after him and trying to keep an eye out for him, it was terribly sad because he was hugely lonely and he really demanded our respect, you know, because this is a horrible situation for a lost juvenile, juvenile male walrus. And actually, the other thing Laurie told us was, Sue, he's tiny. He's only five years old. So he could be a lot bigger. And it's like, oh, my God, he's huge. How can he be wow. <laughs> uh, We've had one question from Melanie as well about seal species. Uh, you mentioned that we now have a third of all grey and common seals in the UK. Uh, where can you find the other ones? OK, so a third of grey seals in the UK, we've got a third of the European harbour seals, so not world harbour seals, just a third of the European subpopulation. Uh, harbour seals are slightly different because they occur in every ocean. Grey seals only occur in the North Atlantic, which is what makes them globally rare. Um, so, apologise, David, could you re-ask the question? Uh, so, where do we find it? So, it was the grey seals the that we got seals, right? Okay. Where, where can we find the other ones in the world? Yeah, so there are two, they're all in the North Atlantic, but there are two subpopulations if you read the papers and the papers say there's a northeast Atlantic, which is ours, and a northwest Atlantic. So the other side of the Atlantic on the northeastern seaboard is where you get the rest of the grey seals. And there are quite a large number of um, grey seals in the Baltic as well. They used to think that the Baltic and the UK population were separate. But um, yeah, they seem to, in more recent times, they seem to have been grouped together. But um, science and DNA suggests that grey seals in Cornwall are genetically distinct from those in Scotland. So the theory is there is an imaginary line around the Isle of Man over which seals do not cross either way. However, there was a seal that was satellite tagged in France and it went all the way to Isla in Scotland. And it didn't go through the Irish Sea, it went round the west coast of Ireland. <laughs> so, you know, obviously there's an exceptions to every yeah. rule. I suspect that rule is probably a good general one, but there will always be exceptions. Great, thank you. 
Uh, I did have one more bit topical question about all the um, sewage that's now recently being released into the sea. How does that impact our seals? Very good question. And the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the longer answer might be it fertilizes the sea and feeds fish. So it might not all be bad. However, sewage carries infection. Seals have massive open orifices to catch infection. They have open wounds. So it could be a balancing act between pros and cons, I guess. Um, the main issue, really emerging issues that I see are things like microplastics, which have been found in fish, seal and human stomachs, uh, you know, but in small quantities. So at the moment they haven't yet lined the stomach completely. So we're still able to digest effectively. That's going to change, isn't it? Um, and the other one is pharmaceutical runoff. So I take prescription medication. Um, I wee it down the toilet and it ends up in the sea. And we know that the hormones that people take are affecting the sex of fish. So we don't know how that's going to impact. And the other one is a historical one. So it's not an emerging issue at all. And it's PCBs. Um, so these were around in the 60s and banned, but they persist in the marine environment and they're fat toxins. So female seals pass these PCBs onto their first pup that probably won't die, will probably won't survive because they've had a massive PCB burden and been poisoned. But thereafter, the mums are able to have a lower PCB burdens and therefore success, successfully feed their pups. However, the males never get to offload their PCB burdens. And in the last month, we've had four middle-aged, if that, so maybe prime-aged male seals that are dead. And until we do, we're desperate actually, David, for somebody to do that research. The samples are there, the um, pathologists have taken the samples, but we just need the money to analyse those samples to prove that PCBs are affecting seals. We know they affect orcas, why wouldn't yeah. they affect seals? But the issue is it's not having a population level effect on seals. So the main seal scientists are not interested. But the reason why it wouldn't have a population level effect is because this is a system of beach masters. So you don't need a large number of males to still continue with a population. Most of your males could, in theory, be dying and you still have the same population. Of course, that might have an effect on pups being able to teach themselves to feed because there are not lots of non-breeding males anymore. But we just desperately need somebody to do that research. So if you know anyone who's got any research funding, the samples are there just crying out to be analysed. And we would love for them to be analysed at the University of Exeter. It's another call to help. Fantastic. And I like how we've gone a circle here and gone back to the social dynamics as well. Um, we do have one question that I'll take as the last question that Robin's put in the chat as well, um, asking about um, about seals as a species again and their evolution. So do we know how ancient they are as a species? And presumably because they're um, ocean creatures, they don't leave too many fossils, so we might not be able to say much about that. Oh, gosh, that's <laughs> never really thought about a seal fossil. That's an interesting question. So genuinely, I don't I don't really know. Um, common and harbour seals are supposed to come from different lineages. Effectively, they come from the same place as cats, dogs, otters and bears, um, more related to dogs than they are to cats. Um, you can see similarities between those species, but I, I wouldn't want to talk very long about the linkages because I really don't know. But more recently, more recent science suggests that maybe harbour and grey seals are not as far distantly related as we first thought. I mean, DNA genetics has come on a long way in the last 10 years, hasn't it? So uh, watch this space. Um, we've always wondered whether we have hybrid seals, uh, and I'm pretty sure we do. Um, I've no proof, but I'm pretty sure we would. I've seen seals that look like they're a hybrid seal, really, um, but they would be sterile, um, so they wouldn't be able to genetically produce themselves. But if you're Ellis, an adult male harbour seal, and you're surrounded by female seals and you have the urge, what are you going to do? Female grey seals, what are you going to do? You know, uh, we've had harbour seal pups for lots and lots of years in Cornwall that have had to be rescued. But I think it was 2019 in the Mammal Society Journal, um, Stephen Westcott published that he'd finally found a successful harbour seal popping site in South Devon. 
And I'm proud to say that for the first year ever, we've done the same in Cornwall in a river estuary habitat uh, this year as well, but we've protected it because it would have been like, you know, if we publicized it or if the local companies had publicized it, it the pup would have stood no chance of surviving, but it has. So we've had our first harbour seal pup as well in Cornwall in 2021, which is super exciting, but they've been doing it for a while just we haven't caught them at it and we don't think it had been successful before but maybe it is now so yeah um lineages sorry can't really answer that to my own satisfaction maybe i need to read up on it robin that's all right still learned a lot in the answer there thank you <laughs> um presumably because obviously they're mammals they won't have been around for as long as some of the other um big old sea creatures like no, but, um, but their bones have been found in the middens in Isles of Scilly so they go back to 4000 BC I think in the middens in the Isles of Scilly grey and common seal bones um, but the problem was there was an awful lot of difficulty in the early well kind of 18th 19th and 20th centuries uh, yeah kind of 1800s 1900s when a lot of the good naturalist work was being done by you know people um however distinguishing the species was not something that could be relied upon so we look quite cautiously at the data because basically if it was a if it was gray they thought it was a gray seal and if it was brown they thought it was a harbor seal and actually brown gray seals are just molting <laughs> So actually, we, we, there's a lot of scepticism in the scientific world, as well as with us, about um, species identity in Cornwall um, going back. But the first paper, I think, was properly published in the 1930s. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to slowly wrap it up here then, uh, seeing as we already learned a lot throughout your talk anyway. What I'll do is I'll pop the links into the chat again. If you want to have a look at that survey uh, that Stu mentioned, that would be we fantastic. really appreciate the survey. Thank you very much. Take you two to four minutes. Um, as I said, the recording will be on our YouTube channel as well, and we'll add these links into the description there too, um, if you don't quite catch them now. Um, I'll quickly plug our next talk, which is organized in cooperation with the Devon and Cornwall branch of the Royal Society of Biology. That will be in two weeks on Wednesday, the 17th of November, uh, on conserving amazing apes and cryptic cats in Borneo. Um, if you're on our mailing list, you will get the link into your inbox as well. So that's in two weeks time. Uh, other than that, the only thing left to do is our kind of end of cafe side tradition. In a second, I'm gonna ask everyone to unmute and if you do, please feel free to join into a round of applause for Sue for a fantastic, engaging talk. I really enjoyed seeing all these movements and how passionate you are over Zoom. So I'm going to ask you all to unmute and start a round of applause for you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it.